This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 777, recorded on 7-6-2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello. And you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. I didn't get the weather yet, but it's hot. Uh, right now, it's 89 degrees Fahrenheit, which uh, is just plain hot, something in the 30s, high 30s. Yeah, very hot here. 33 Celsius, Celsius here. Very, very hot. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Unsurprisingly, it is also very hot here. Uh, it is 97 Fahrenheit, uh, which is just too many Celsius. I'm sorry, 93 Fahrenheit here. It's getting up to 97 today. Our guest today is from the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, coming back for the fourth time on Twitter. Ron Fouché, welcome back. Thank you very much. It's great to be back. It's uh, pretty cool here. It's uh, 18 centigrade, so that must be wow. somewhere around 65, but it's 8 p.m., huh? so it's night here. Does it get really hot there during the days in the summer, or no? No, no, no. I, I think uh, our average summer temperatures are about 25 centigrade. Wow. So. Is that because it's the lowlands, right, by the sea? Yeah, and, and a sea climate, huh? yeah. Okay. We, we live at the North Sea, and usually we have a breeze coming in from the sea, so it's, it never gets really hot. Uh, this is episode 777. That's a number that Daniel wanted, but uh, he missed it by one because he said, I want the big plane, the 777. But sorry, Daniel, 778 for you. Maybe there'll be a 778 plane, right? Who knows? One day. So, Ron, I, I asked you to come on to talk about, uh, you're an expert at transmission of viruses and um, I want to talk about SARS-CoV-2 transmission. But before we get into that, I wanted to, uh, so the last times uh, you were on, I think the Fort Collins one was following up at the end of the avian influenza transmission experiments that you and uh, uh, Yoshikawa Oka had done. There was a pause in research. So fill us in on what happened. The pause was eventually lifted. Is that correct? Yeah, when I was in Fort Collins, we just published uh, a follow-up paper on the 2012 one. So in 2012, we showed that an avian H5N1 bird flu virus can become transmissible in, in the mammal model. And then in 2014, we finished uh, the more detailed work where we figured out all of the uh, traits of that virus and all the, the minimum genetic mm -hmm. changes that it was required to change this avian virus in a mammalian transmissible one. But shortly thereafter, we had to stop again because uh, then there was the, were some incidents in US labs with uh, Ebola, I think it was, and there was a smallpox finding at the FDA. Was it the FDA or the CDC? I don't remember which one, but then uh, the administration shut down all of the uh, gain of function research again, claiming that if the big US labs uh, would be uh, sloppy, then all other labs must be sloppy too. And so they shut, all, shut down all of the, uh, the labs that were doing uh, gain of function research with select agents. They were shut down again. Um, and that stopped, I think, in 2019. So five years, uh, the, the, all of the research was stopped. Of course, uh, we could do other things. We could work with naturally uh, transmissible viruses. And in fact, we had a huge outbreak here in uh, Europe with seal flu viruses. So this is a H10N7 avian virus that, uh, that got uh, into seals here in uh, Denmark, Germany, Sweden, the Netherlands, and started to transmit between the seals. So it was essentially a repeat of our experiment, but now not in a BSL-3 facility, but on the beach. And uh, so it spread through thousands uh, of seals, killing thousands of seals too. And, and we investigated uh, what happened there and we've actually found the exact same changes again of uh, uh, mutations in the hemagglutinin that ch change receptor specificity, a change that makes it more acid stable. So very much the same as 
human pandemic strains and the H5N1 bird flu virus. So it helped us to to really get to the more solid ground about you know what are the minimal determinants of mammalian transmission. And then in 2019, uh, the uh, new uh, P3CO uh, arrangement came out from the U.S. government, so a new oversight policy. So we went in for the third time to uh, to get approval for our research, and we did get approval again. And so uh, we are back to business, of course, very carefully. But uh, we are doing still research on uh, on uh, transmission of uh, of zoonotic viruses between mammals. So you mentioned that some of these restrictions are sort of U.S. based restrictions. Um, can you sort of mention how they impact you, given that you're in Rotterdam? Right. So, so the, the whole issue has got started because the U.S. doesn't have very strict regulations to begin with. All of Europe and most countries in the world have very strict GMO regulations. So I need to get permits if I want to genetically modify a virus, which means that the oversight is automatically in place in countries like the Netherlands. But uh, in the U.S., in principle, if you had private funding, you could do this research in your garage and, and you would not be violating any laws, eh? except when you use select agents, of course. But any other virus, you could do this effectively in your garage. If you don't have NIH funding, right? Because if you have NIH funding, you have to play by the BMBL book and things like that. But if you have private funding in the U.S., you could do this type of stuff in your garage. And that was really what... Uh, what triggered in the U.S. this this oversight policy needed to come into place. But this policy was already in place in, in most countries in Europe. And in fact, there was a formal document from the academies of science in Europe to, to make this very explicit, that all of this research was already highly regulated in Europe. You, you cannot just do that. You, as you know, we and TWIV recently did your paper on influenza virus transmission from the nasal respiratory epithelium uh, in ferrets. And um, I was wondering if, if you're doing similar experiments with SARS-CoV-2. Yes, we, uh, we did, of course, uh, use our model to investigate SARS-CoV-2. And we very rapidly found that SARS-CoV-2 in the ferret model was, was going through droplets or aerosol uh, to transmit. Uh, but but what's, what's, well, what was interesting is that the next thing we did was to try SARS-CoV-1 mm. from 2003, where we knew that this was not particularly airborne in humans in 2003. And the only real evidence of aeros aerosol or, or droplet transmission in 2003 was associated with hospital procedures where a virus was uh, physically aerosolized, not through natural routes. And, but what we found was that if we put SARS-CoV-1 in our ferret model, it actually transmitted even better than SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. And so from that, we conclude that the ferret model for SARS-CoV-2 is not a good model to model human to human transmission because it was so incredibly transmissible in the ferret model. And, and in fact, the, what, what we see in ferrets is very much the same as what we see in mink. We have in the Netherlands many mink far farms and there were reports also from uh, Denmark and uh, and also in the USA, I think, uh, where these these viruses really spread like wild, wildfire mm. through these big uh, farms. And so what we see in ferrets is very much uh, in line with that, but not so much in line with what we see in humans. I think if we would see this type of pattern of transmission in humans, this, this outbreak would go much, much faster. But of course, still, the so it's not a good model to study what, what it takes for SARS to COV-2 to become transmissible. It's still a, an interesting model to perhaps evaluate some intervention strategies, you know, whether vaccination or, or drugs or, or even uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions might block uh, SARS-CoV-2 transmission uh, because the ferret mm -hmm. model is very uh, efficient in that. So, Yeah, in fact, molnupiravir has been tested in, in ferrets uh, and seems to block transmission quite well. Yeah, we, we've uh, my colleagues here also tested some uh, some uh, lipid particles. Mm. I think it was in the ferret model and also block transmission. Yeah. So, did you get um, uh, pulled into SARS-CoV-2 research, or were you able to maintain your your influenza virus interest? 
Well, so after 2003, so I've been involved in the SARS uh, investigation in 2003, but after that, we uh, actually launched a new uh, SARS expert team uh, headed by Bart uh, Haagmans. So we now actually have a, a specialized uh, coronavirus team. And also the head of our department, Marion Koopmans, who was in your show, I think, uh, just a few weeks ago, she she did a PhD in, in coronaviruses. Eh? So we have two people that are specialized in coronaviruses. So I uh, decided to step aside and not uh, be the third uh, captain on this ship. Uh, and rather, uh, my, I, I offered my personnel to Bart and Marion to support them in their research. But but I don't think a ship with three captain, captains uh, will go a long way. So I <laughs> I decided to stay on fluke. But of course, there's so much to do now. Now all the coronavirus virologists are busy doing their thing. Uh, the editorial jobs that I have and the reviewing jobs uh, get a little bit more time. So I, I, I spend a lot of time uh, reviewing and editing papers uh, to, uh, to let us, the, the coronavirus community do their thing. So I don't, I don't know how uh, I originally started discussing this with you, but... We, we we somehow started talking about SARS-CoV-2 transmission, and and then you sent me this uh, PowerPoint stack, which is is called a virologist perspective on uh, SARS-CoV-2 variants, and you know it turned out we had very similar views. What was the? Is this a talk that you gave uh, frequently? Well, uh, let me. So uh, I, in in the winter, I, I do some sports in in my basement, and then I watch watch sometimes your show. And I saw you talk about variants, and I I, I had just given this uh, this this uh, lecture uh, at a at a meeting, and I heard that you were a little bit uh, under fire for what you said about variants in your vision on the on the whole issue. So I I figured I send you. Uh, that's right. Uh, yeah. A little bit support from my end uh, that I would agree <laughs> with you. Uh, and so I send you my slide deck, which also here, of course, uh, raises some uh, discussion. Mm. Uh, but I think we, uh, we largely agree on, uh, okay. on what we do and do not know about the transmissibility of uh, variants. So let's start by just defining transmission. Because I, I don't think everyone uses it similarly. It's just you're the expert on transmission. What's your definition? <laughs> or a expert? Well, if, it, if, you, if you look at it as a, a viral trait, so that's, I think, how we should be discussing this. Mm. It's really the, the ability to go from one host to the next. Okay. And, and I think the way these variant transmission have been uh, talked about they, they call them more, these viruses more transmissible or more contagious or infectious. Whereas really what they mean is that the virus spreads better. Mm -hmm. And that is not the same thing. So I, I, I think if you, if you talk about a virus being more transmissible or more contagious, that you more refer to the intrinsic virus property rather than a virus property plus the host permissiveness or the host... Um, Mm -hmm. uh, the host factor in this transmission chain. But of course, human behavior inevitably affects the spread of a virus. That's what the reproductive index is partly determined by, right? Absolutely. Yes, but but I, I think so. I'm, I'm going to just call it what it is. I think what I think it is. <laughs> So I, I think we're seeing much more spread of some of these variants because some of these variants evade population immunity, host immunity better than the previous uh, variants. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, you see more rapid spread in a partially immune population. But I would not call this intrinsically more transmissible. So mm -hmm. I would call this immune escape. You know, let's call it what it is. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this captures really well the English language problem I don't know if it plays out in other languages as well, but that spread and transmission mm. in kind of popular parlance are probably pretty good synonyms. But in this context, transmission is different from spread, the, the way we've just discussed it. Yeah, yeah. so you, you've used the words transmission, um, infectiousness, and contagiousness. 
Um, would you say that those are similar or would you give specific different definitions to those? No, I, I think it, infectious, I would say, is the amount of virus per, per um, number of particles to cause an infection. And that's, I, I guess, hmm. and, and, and contagious, I would, I would probably say that this is also the, the, the infectious per PFU ratio. Huh? So if you have a virus that is only, the, that one PFU is, is one infectious unit, I would call this more contagious, I guess, than if you need a thousand PFU to do one infection. Transmissibility, I would say, is really the potential to, for a virus to travel from me as a host to the next host mm -hmm. and infect that next host. And so it, it involves multiple, multiple factors at the same time. It's the amount of virus that is produced in the donor, then the release of those particles into the air or in droplets, then the stability in the air when it travels from me to the next person, the virus needs to be stable. Uh, through that process, then it infects the next host, and there, of course, it, the 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 high, the more infectious the virus is, or contagious, I don't know how you call it, the the better transmission you get. But this is a very complex uh, process, and then the final step there is, of course, whether this new host actually is immune or not. If that host is immune, the virus still won't transmit. I, I think I guess part of the problem is that epidemiologists measure transmission, you know, by the reproductive number, which includes both virus intrinsic properties, as you've said, and, and human. But there's no real way to quantify virus transmission only, right? Ignoring the human part. Is there a way to measure? I, I guess you can't, right? Because you need... <laughs> Well, so I think, you, so the r not you can only determine in a, in, in a, in a naive population, right? Uh, yes. Otherwise, otherwise, you would start to get into effective reproduction numbers or, or reproduction in time. Right. Um, but what you can do in, in an immunologically naive population is to just look at how many people get infected by one infected individual. Mm -hmm. So that is essentially... Are not now. What the epidemiologists are currently doing is to infer from genetic data from the distribution of two variants or two or more variants and and the change in their distribution in time. They are calculating a relative R. Yeah. And 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 this is where I think it goes wrong because they're they're really not measuring R at all. They're they're measuring the spread. Um, and, 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 and we all also know that sometimes even uh, you know, drift without natural selection, just random drift, we can see changes in populations of, of variants. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that this variant can be due to uh, seeding events and, and you know, people going to parties and spreading it more than they, they would have done a week earlier. And so, there, for instance, that this is, I think, something that could have happened over Christmas uh, last year when we saw this massive spread. And so I think we have to be really careful to calculate R, relative R, from genetic data in, in the databases. That is, that is, I think, where this is going wrong. And so you, you can, what you should be doing is field studies where, where you're actually determining how many people get infected by uh, a person and you compare this for one variant to the next. But these are, of course, very difficult and very expensive studies. But that's the best way to get to R. Yeah, I know that in the, well, there was an opportunity early, what year was it? Early this year, or maybe late 2020, when the Alpha variant first started to penetrate, and there still were some people infected with the ancestral virus. So that could have been a time to do that experiment now. But in many populations, there's a predominant variant, so it's hard to do those those experiments that you're discussing. 
Well, they, 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 they tried to do it in the Netherlands. Eh? So when the Alpha variant uh, entered the Netherlands, it entered into a school. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and Marion Koopmans and her team started to, and with, the, with the civil health service here in the Netherlands, I think they tested 50 or 60,000 people around that, uh, that school. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as I've seen the numbers, those are the, the paper still hasn't been published, unfortunately, uh, because they're still doing some uh, analysis on it. But as far as I can tell, there was no evidence that, that this virus really spread or, or transmitted better than, uh, mm-hmm. than the, 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 the earlier variant. It's really remarkable to me that what seems to be a fundamentally incorrect calculation still can spread globally and permeate every news bureau, apparently, and everyone just repeats it. I mean, do, do you... Is there any reason for that? What do you think? Well, I, I want to say one thing, and <laughs> that is I, I cannot disprove the fact that these viruses would be more sure, transmissible. Sure. See, that's where the problem is. Huh? Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not, I've never said that the alpha variant is not more transmissible than the prior variant mm-hmm. or the delta variant compared to the alpha variant. And uh, you know, I, I, I simply haven't seen the evidence for it. Okay. That's what right. I keep saying. If you're saying it's more transmissible, please show us the evidence. And, and that is, of course, our problem now, Vincent. How are we going to prove them wrong? Yeah. Because it's very difficult to prove that something is not happening. Yes. So I think we should have put that pressure on the people who are claiming it's more transmissible to actually show increased transmissibility. I mean, to be fair, some the CDC often says, which appears to be more transmissible, but then WHO just says more transmissible, and then the New York Times says more transmissible, and there's no nuance at all, right? Right. But there's, of course, a number of, of uh, interesting uh, aspects that are being measured. You know, there's now a number of studies that, that clearly show that in you know, many thousands of samples, there's a higher RNA virus load and even higher infectious virus load in, in uh, with, for instance, the, the alpha variant. Uh, the, so there is some data that also would be in line with increased transmissibility. You know, if you produce 10 times more virus, you're maybe you're more, more likely to transmit. But uh, again, the problem is that this virus is, this variant virus is now measured in a partially immune population. Mm. And therefore also here, the virus load may simply be higher because it is b- better able to infect a partially immune population. It gives more escape. But, but of course, the, the fact that you're seeing higher load gives for some people indication, oh, see, yeah. it is more transmissible. Right. Well, I mean, early on, the, the viral loads were just being approximated by PCR, which... I, I thought at least you should measure infectious shedding from people, but that's not been done as far as I can tell. Well, that's, that's now one very nice study by a, a good friend of mine who is in the in the Drosten lab in Germany. His name is Terry Jones. He published a paper in Science last month, mm-hmm. really showing uh, a, about a log higher uh, RNA virus load and also substantially higher uh, uh, culturability of the viruses from these samples. I think two or three times more likely probab- probability of culturing a virus from the alpha variant than the prior variant. Mm. But again, also he is very careful in, in, in assuming or, or um, concluding from that that the virus actually is more transmissible because there's many biases in the data, including mm. the issue of, of partial immune escape. Yep. And, and then would you say that there's limitations in studying animal models for transmissibility of the variants just because they're animal models. I mean, again, is it, is it sort of um, circumstantial or s- supporting evidence, but still just doesn't get us there? Well, so that's why I, I started saying how, how poor the ferret model is for, for the coronavirus is because the, the least transmissible of the two SARS viruses is the more transmissible in the ferret model. So yeah, what does that tell us? Yeah. And then, of course, what, what is really interesting about these uh, 
escape mutants, whether it's alpha, beta, gamma, delta, they all have these substitutions in the receptor binding domain and in the end terminal domain that affect binding to the receptor. And so we now see that some of these variants actually start to infect mice, which the earlier variants did not, simply mm -hmm. because of these mutations yeah. in the spike protein. And we see higher affinity of some of these mutations. We see lower affinity of others. So this virus is really balancing, uh, the, this balancing of the spike binding to the receptor. And this is probably all related to immune escape. So the, you, you can escape from antibodies mm -hmm. by tuning affinity. If you have higher affinity to receptor, you may be more difficult to neutralize. Because the antibodies so, are blocking receptor attachment, right? Yes, and, and you, know, if you can also weaken the binding, but actually yeah. increase the, high, the, the uh, multivalent interaction. So you increase the density of protein. You also can change. You know, there are so many ways by which uh, a virus can escape from neutralizing antibody related to the receptor binding. And in this case, it's even more complex because of the potential two different receptors that the spike might be binding to. So that is very difficult to interpret it. Uh, and that's, I think, what we also see in, in these animal experiments where people have done very nice competition ex experiments to show indeed that the new variants are outcompeting the older ones. Mm. But, you know, this is, this is just to show the interaction with the receptor. Yeah. It's not yeah. necessarily showing increased transmissibility in humans. And when, I, when we were doing our old experiment in 2012, Vincent always gave us a lot of uh, a, a, a hard time by, by trying to conclude anything from humans from looking at our ferret study. So, <laughs> see, and, and Vincent, the, the flu system is, is fairly well aligned yeah. for, between humans and ferrets, but I don't think that's the case for the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, models. It also, there are changes in other proteins besides spike in all the variants, and no one really factors those in. This can make a difference as well, right? So I think if you wanted to try and go in the lab and look in cells or animals, you need to not just do spike, the other proteins, right? Absolutely, yeah. The, the, the earliest variants had the very interesting deletions and the, uh, what was it? Uh, or fate. Uh, or, or, or one, yeah, or fate, yeah. And, and so how, if, if that were really an advantageous change for the virus, mm -hmm. it would have acquired that much earlier in the pandemic. So that, that's another interesting thing to consider that early in the pandemic, the first half year or year, there hardly was any substantial genetic variation. It was almost a clonal expansion. It's, a, it's an ugly word, word in virology, of course, but there was a very little variation for an RNA virus mm. early in the pandemic. But, but th those changes were noted. There, there were viruses with this deletion in, in the same uh, position yeah. in uh, yeah. ORF8, but they weren't selected. But if they were, would really be more transmissible at that time, they would have been naturally selected early. But they were only selected late. They were only selected when a substantial population was becoming immune, like right. in Manaus in Brazil or in South Africa or in the UK. This, after many, many people got infected, this is when the variant starts to get selected. And so, hmm. yeah, for me, as a flu guy, but see, I'm not a corona guy, so I, I, can, I can make mistakes about coronaviruses. <laughs> but as a flu guy, I would say, you know, there's no evidence for increased transmissibility and there's really good evidence for antigenic drift is what we call it for flu. Mm -hmm. Some people don't like that term, but in influenza we call this antigenic drift. So selection, natural selection of immune escape variants. So that was one thing you wrote to me some time ago, which I which was made a lot of sense. Why don't you tell us what we see on an annual basis with influenza virus and why it reflects fitness and not transmission changes. Yeah, so the, the, the slide that I sent to you was really a, a picture from the uh, next strain guys. So the next strain guys, they, 
they plot how the variants uh, emerge in time and how one variant population takes over in time from uh, from the from a previous one and and those they give you these really nice uh, fluctuations of the different variants in time is it and, this, and I actually, uh, is, it, is ah, that there we go is that it yeah yeah that's the one yeah and so what you see here clearly so this is the, the data coming from the GISA database uh, processed by the next train folks uh, and the top one here is the uh, the SARS uh, two variants with an orange on the on the right side, side there is the uh, the alpha mm. uh, variant and there's also already the uh, the the I, I think it's yeah, the beta variant is coming at the bottom also in red, but you can see the same waves mm. actually happen for influenza A H three N two virus or H one N one or B B Victoria. You see very rapid changes in the variants that uh, that emerge, and and these variants for for flu are antigenic drift variants, mm -hmm. right? So these are variants that escape. Uh, population immunity and therefore become dominant in time. And, and the speed by which this is happening, uh, so the, the slope of these uh, increases, is really no different yeah. uh, between SARS-2 and flu. But for flu, we never hear anybody talk about more transmissible variants. Uh, we just say, oh, see, this virus is, is able to escape some uh, population immunity. So why the do, difference? Do know? Sorry, go ahead, Brian. Do we know anything about sort of the immune responses that are being uh, that are being escaped from or epitopes or anything like that when you look at that? Yeah, so my, that's one of the projects that my, my team has been working on for the last 20 years. We show that have shown for for each of these flu virus subtypes, it's usually just one, maybe two amino acid substitutions right next to the receptor binding pocket of the hemagglutinin that makes this, this major change. Of course, some changes can add to it somewhere else on the hemagglutinin, but it's really usually just one or two amino acid substitutions right next to the receptor binding pocket that, uh, that stop neutralizing antibodies from neutralizing the virus. And so um, th this, this might be <laughs> very similar to what we see actually uh, for SARS-CoV-2, where maybe there are more changes. And so most of these variants for SARS-2 are combinations of, of two or three substitutions. I, I, I guess that is restoring the balance of binding to the receptors. Uh, but for fluid, this is very well known, yes. So why is there such a difference in the interpretation of the data from flu, which the, the, these, the shifts are very similar in between the various influenza H3N2, H1N1, et cetera, and SARS-CoV-2. Yet, why the big difference in the interpretation? Probably you don't have an answer, but I'm curious. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I, I think th this, this whole interpretation went wrong the, f the first time uh, this thing really happened, and that was mm -hmm. with the... Uh, with the, uh, the British variant, or well, I should call it alpha variant now, where people called it more transmissible. And that initial call was based on also on an observation that there might be higher loads, RNA mm. virus load. Mm. And so it was a, a very rapid jumping to conclusions. Uh, but then the whole field took that idea forward. Mm. And and, uh, and and you weren't uh, loud enough in your voice against it, uh, Vincent. <laughs> Neither was I, by the way. Yeah, I, I just... No, I, I, I tried to. I, I've tried to talk to people here in the Netherlands and, and try to correct them, but still, it is... Mm. Apparently, it is convenient to call these viruses more transmissible. It also puts maybe some urgency on people to maintain distance and to wear their face masks and to stay home when they're sick. And I think it's just an easier message to give. But uh, as a scientist, uh, I oppose to it. I just want to think that go ahead. some of it uh, was perhaps for the coronaviruses because we know that they have some proofreading activity. And so that alters their mutation rate relative to other RNA viruses. And and it, it wasn't as easy to think about anagenic drift because of that. Mm. Uh, do you think that played in? 
Yes, and uh, also there, there was nothing known really about antigenic drift, except that uh, uh, some uh, little while ago, Jesse Bloom's lab actually showed that uh, mm. coronavirus 229E uh, also has some clear evidence for drift. That was also in my slide deck that I sent to uh, to Vincent. Uh, so there, there is uh, evidence now for the coronaviruses mm. to drift antigenically as well. Now, what, what I, I think one of the, the the factors that made me hesitate in the beginning, otherwise I, I might have been more vocal early on, is the fact that these variants that emerged early had so many mutations at the same time, right? So for flu, we see one or few mutations, mm -hmm. and then you can measure the antigenic differences, and we know we're dealing with a drift virus. Here, there was there was a lot of changes happening eh, in the in orf one ab and then the multiple substitutions in the in the uh, receptor binding domain and multiple mutations in the N-terminal domains of the spike. And all of these things together were set, they were really variants that were very unusual to everything we'd seen before, which, which raises questions about how they emerge. You know, might they have been emerging in the in an animal species that was temporarily infected or in an immunocompromised person, uh, like we also see sometimes with polio viruses that, that, that can change enormously over time. And so that, that, that there were so many changes in, the, in these genomes and, and still several of the uh, variants of concern have many changes. And, and that makes it difficult, more difficult to argue for simply just uh, antigenic drift as we see it for flu. So that, that, that made me a little bit uncomfortable to, to come in too aggressively in the discussion uh, early on. So when, the, when these were first described, um, there was also some discussion of how we could determine a difference between um, changes in fitness or transmissibility or just sort of neutral genetic drift. Um, and so what types of things do you look for that tell you um, sort of which of those things is happening? You know, how do you know whether or not this is just neutral genetic drift? Well, I think neutral, neutral genetic drift in this case was, was uh, based on, on many laboratory experiments, was e easy to, to put aside. Huh? You can see these viruses escape from monoclonal antibodies, from polyclonal antibodies. Very early it was noticed that these viruses change in the affinity for ACE2. And so there were many phenotypic differences that would make it hard to claim absolute neutral drift. At least there was plenty of phenotype data in vitro th that would suggest that that might have an effect uh, in, in vivo as well. Now, coming back to the, the, the point, what is it that makes these viruses m more... Um, uh, spreading than the previous variant, yeah, that I think can only be done with appropriate field studies at the moment. Of course, you can measure this in an animal model, but we just discussed that this might just be reading, uh, might just be a very expensive essay to read out receptor binding. <laughs> uh, and so, but already I think it, it, it makes some sense to do uh, virus neutralization assay with whole virus rather than just looking at the receptor binding domain or just looking at the N-terminal domain or looking at an ELISA. You know, so there are some experiments that are better than others to establish um, uh, consequences of the genetic changes we see. But, uh, but to infer from these mutations plus some in vitro phenotypes whether it's tra more transmissible or not, is is close to is well, it's impossible, really. Let me put up this one slide of yours here. Um, you say, assuming initial R naught two and a half, and variants with thirty percent increased transmissibility. So then, that thirty percent is simply applied to the R naught, and you get these increasing three point three, four point two, five, five, seven, one, and the, the seven is what. Uh, uh, Laurie Garrett cited nine three, and then you say probably not dot dot dot. dot. <laughs> so no, I, see, I I don't I don't I haven't seen any evidence that the R naught has gone up. We don't know, right? So you you can calculate R naught at the beginning and then yeah. 
you, you take it from there. But see, I, I don't think that, uh, that SARS-CoV-2 is close to having an R close to measles mm -hmm. or chickenpox. You know, I don't think so. So can you repeat what you said earlier? How, did, how are they, where do they get the 30% more transmissible number? They're simply measuring numbers of new infections? Well, and, and so that 30% is actually a conservative uh, uh, citation of what people used. So uh, the alpha variant in the UK initially was reported to be 70% more transmissible. Mm -hmm. And I think right now we see reports of the delta variant being, again, 60% more transmissible than the previous variants. So, you know, if you add up those numbers, it just can't be correct. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we are approaching an R of, of 10. Yeah, I always had trouble with this idea that we have this inevitable increase in transmissibility. And of course, something we, we haven't even touched. Vir everyone is more virulent um, <laughs> than the previous one as well, right? Yeah. Um, so well, early on, I thought, I, I thought to frame this in terms of fitness, which is the same as you have done. So for, you know, if a virus somehow has a fitness advantage, it can outpeat, outcompete another one. And that's what happens. And, and I think an important point to make is that when these, when any given variant reaches a, a country, it doesn't always predominate, right? If it were biologically more transmissible, you would think it would predominate everywhere it ended up, right? Is that a reasonable, is that logical? Well, of course, there are now multiple variants, and it's possible that multiple variants are more fit than, for instance, alpha, mm -hmm. right? So if, and so that could be, but if, if we go back to, for instance, the alpha variant story in the UK that picked up very, very uh, fast in December, right? And this was the time when uh, Boris Johnson decided to relax uh, the situation a little bit and people would go out Christmas shopping. But at the same time, that virus was already present in the USA, but in the USA it took forever to take off. Mm. It took much longer to take off. And so whereas the UK concluded there was a 60 or 70 percent increased transmissibility, if you look at the early USA numbers, that certainly wasn't the case. And so mm -hmm. I agree with you that so before alpha, we had the, uh, what was it, the, the, the D614G That's variant. Right. That's right. Right. So that was dominant in the US and it was dominant in the UK. And then in both countries, uh, uh, the alpha variant landed, but then the, the, the speed by which it increased yeah. was very different in the UK and in the US early on. So uh, you in for the, for influenza viruses, um, the fitness increase is a consequence of uh, immune escape, essentially, right? Yeah. So in, in influenza, I think uh, the average people a person gets reinfected once every ten years. So, so and so that means that a, a ten percent uh, of ten percent population immunity mm. difference is enough to get selection of these new drift variants, right? So if, 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 uh, if you get reinfected, if 10% if of the world population would get infected by a flu virus every 10 years, then, then, every, then the, 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 the advantage of the new variants is just the ability to infect a partially immune population mm. that's 10% larger. And so if, if we, if we extrapolate that to SARS-CoV-2, then in cities like Manaus or in South Africa, that, 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 those levels will definitely obtain when the, when the variants were selected. And the same is true in India. <clears throat> so those, those levels of population immunity uh, were definitely uh, present. And, and part of that population is, of course, not so immunocompetent, maybe just had undergone... Uh, a very low level infection and just partially partial immunity. And so once you get to, to having 10% of a population partial immunity, then, then that is a substantial advantage for a virus if you can escape that 10% mm -hmm. immunity. So is there, 
So essentially, you don't need a, a large fitness increase to predominate is what you're saying, right? That's right. And so these variants may may emerge in cities where, where the, yeah. I think Manaus, of, of course, I think there was mention of more than 30%, maybe even 60% uh, zero prevalence when the, when the, the variant uh, took up. And that is, of course, a huge uh, advantage. And if you can... Sure. If you can then uh, evade that immunity in, even in ten percent of that population. So, aside from immune evasion, antigenic drift, whatever we want to call it, are there other ways that increased fitness can be achieved by a virus? I have a hard time uh, coming up with anything. <laughs> so, uh, if you if you go back to the to the December 2019 situation. So a virus jumps from an animal to a human. And of course there, there's going to be a very strong natural selection of variants mm -hmm. that, that do better in this initial human or initial number of humans. But once this virus has infected 100,000 people in which it produced 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11 particles, you know, so in the initial six months of the pandemic, such incredible strength of, of natural selection. So I think by that time you reach some fitness peak, mm -hmm. the virus will reach a fitness peak and there's really no improvement from there. So fitness differences have already been selected by that time. Mm -hmm. And so the, the only way by which a new fitness peak might be obtained is, is if the virus goes through some, um, uh, yeah, loses, loses temporarily, loses fits, it make, makes a lot of mutations like we maybe see with the variants. And, or if the host population changes, right? so the host population becomes immune, now we get to a different a fitness landscape for this virus. What happens if a virus uh, goes into, say, mink, and it becomes, you know, more, more fit for mink? Does it lose fitness for humans, you think? I think so. And uh -huh. in fact, none of those uh, mink outbreaks have led to substantial human-to-human uh -huh. -human transmission. So there have been humans infected with mink viruses. So the virus goes from humans into mink. It changes a lot. There's a lot mm -hmm. of genetic changes observed. Some of these viruses jump back in humans, but none of them make it into a new uh, dominant strain in humans. Mm -hmm. Now, in, I'm, I'm struck by the magnitude and frequency of these. Well, I guess there aren't that many different antigenic changes in spike. They're just different combinations and, and so forth. But... During a flu pandemic, have we, I guess 2009, the most recent, were we able to sample and sequence like we do today and see w whether there were similar uh, antigenic changes occurring? No, and, and that situation is, is very difficult to compare to begin mm. with. So suddenly we, we didn't sequence anywhere close to yeah. what we're doing today. It's just crazy what we're sequencing today. The amount of, of you know, what, what we, we've hit, Two and a half million or something sequences. Mm, yeah. I, I, I think in 2009, we were happy to get a couple of thousand sequences in the first year. But also, so that, that virus um, was infecting a partially immune population. Huh? Mm -hmm. So I, I think you've discussed this previously with uh, Alan and, uh, and, and Rich. Mm -hmm. Uh, that you were so surprised that uh, that this virus was called virulent by some people in the flu field, and, and you didn't consider it virulent. But in fact, this virus was virulent in humans, except mm -hmm. the fact that everybody who was normal risk group was already immune. Mm -hmm. See, the, the 2009 virus was a offspring from the 1918 pandemic and that virus right. 1918 circulated till 1957. So everybody who would usually be within the flu risk groups was protected in 2009. Right. But if you, if you take this yeah. 2009 virus, put it into any animal model or in immunologically naive humans, it was a pretty severe infection. Right. So, 
But that 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 immunity, of course, really reduced the levels of virus turnover early on, and and really we haven't seen a lot of drift in H1 viruses altogether. So H1 virus seem to be much more restricted to escape from antibodies than, for instance, H3 and 2 influenza virus. So they, these drift much quicker. And we're still investigating why that might be. Mm. But there's, there's multiple reasons why you cannot really compare the 2009 pandemic with what we're currently seeing with SARS-2. In addition to what Kathy just said about the error rate, which are completely different for these viruses to begin with. Yeah. I, I, I suppose the next influenza pandemic where we will have good sequencing, we can, and if we get a totally new virus, not another recycled H1N1, maybe we can address this, right? That'll be the time to Absolutely. do it. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I hope we, we will never see a flu pandemic again, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that we now have our sequencing capacity in place for any uh, new emerging infectious disease event. Why do you think we might not have another flu pandemic? Well, that's why we do a lot of research, right? <laughs> we try to uh, we try to prevent pandemics, and uh, I, I, of course, I, we we will see other pandemics, but we also may be able to prevent a bunch. Mm. And so, I hope we can postpone it so that uh, until I retire, we won't see another pandemic. <laughs> I hope we can just do nice research. So, in in I'm wondering about your views since we've been addressing the um, the antigenic change and the uh, impact on fitness. What what's the um, end game of the current pandemic? Do you, how do you see? I mean, SARS-CoV-2 is with us forever. It's not going to be eradicated. But do you think it becomes a, another common cold coronavirus where most people have immunity and therefore the the pathogenesis is quite low? Yes, that's what I think. Uh, of course, um, how fast this will go mm. is something that's hard to guess. But, you know, we have four endemic human coronaviruses and they must have all gone, come from animal reservoirs like this one. And so I think this is number five in line. And uh, whether there have been any that, uh, that caused the pandemic and then disappeared, we will never know because mm. we can't. But the, if you look at the level of uh, spread around the globe and the enormous differences in the uptake of vaccines, I think we're not going to be eradicating this one. Yeah. And so, uh, if and if we if we now see that uh, uh, most people that that have been vaccinated are, are well protected, both against the original variants as well as the VOCs so far, then I I would think that after. Uh, We've, we've vaccinated most people in our countries that this thing will quickly become uh, low impact, mm. right? Because uh, I am now fully vaccinated. I'm, I'm going to be exposed the coming winter by many people that have been out in bars and stuff and coming out of foreign countries or I go on conferences and I'll, I, I will constantly be yeah. exposed to this virus. So I will constantly be boosted uh, with particles of this virus in my upper airways. And, and that is going to bring uh, a continuous level of immunity in all of us after we've got, all gone through immunization by infection or vaccination. Right. And then, of course, the elderly and people with other people with a poor immune system, they're going to suffer. And I think some of us occasionally are going to suffer from like we do now from other coronavirus or flu viruses. I guess. Mm. But my crystal ball is not so yes, good at the moment for this. So. Let, me, let me ask you one more thing. So for, for influenza virus, we, or you and the, the, the epidemiologists, look at antigenic drift on a yearly basis. And you make a decision whether to change the vaccine based on, you know, antigenic tests and so forth. So I guess... How much does it have to change for the vaccine to be changed? And have we, where I'm going is trying to figure out if, how we can figure out if we need to change uh, the coronavirus vaccine to match the, whatever the circulate. It's kind of the same thing as we do for flu every year, right? Yeah, but, uh, but it's also very different. Uh -huh. 
uh, or for multiple reasons. So, so one is that the uh, for flu we we have a magic number. Huh? We have a, a correlate of protection. Mm-hmm. So we know that if our antibodies drop be, be, below a certain level, that we will get reinfected. This is built up over 100 years of experience or 70 years of flu vaccines. We also know how to assess that in the lab. So we can do a HI assay, this very classical assay of, of investigating how well an antibody neutralizes a virus. And we know how much uh, a, a, a vaccine can be different from the circulating virus to mm-hmm. still be enough of a match to, to give protection. Now, for the coronavirus, we know none of this, right? Mm-hmm. We don't have a correlate protection. We don't know what the level of antibodies need to be. In fact, we don't even have an assay that we all agree on. Mm-hmm. If, if, if somebody in the U.S. measures antibodies to corona and somebody in the Netherlands and the U.K., we get three different answers. There's no standardization of the test. There's no, not even agreement on which test. Should we do virus neutralization? Should we do a, a VLP uh, uh, RBD domain uh, neutralization? Should we do an ELISA? Mm-hmm. So the, the, we, we don't have that uh, expertise yet. So this is something that's now urgently needed. We need to assess quantitatively the antigenic difference between the different variants, which is something we have for flu. And we need to decide on an assay which, which actually gives a, 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 a mm. relevant parameter for human immunity. But the second thing is, of course, this is a complete different class of vaccines that we're currently using. So mm. flu, we just grow up flu, we inactivate it, we purify the hemagglutinin, and we yank that protein in our arms, and then we, we mount an antibody response, a poor antibody response, in fact, often to this, to this hemagglutinin. But now with the mRNA vaccines and the adenovirus vaccines, we get very potent T-cell responses too. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we haven't talked about yet, but if in all of the studies that have looked at T-cell responses, you see that the T-cell responses neutralize or or recognize the variants just as well as the original wild type. And so I I think that, that these vaccines are going to last quite some time relative to flu. So mm. they also give very high antibody titers, much higher antibody titers than flu vaccines do. And so here is actually a profit that, that other vir- virology fields may get from this SARS pandemic, is that we actually might be able to get better flu vaccines yeah. that are based on mRNA yeah. and actually induce some T-cell responses that gives much longer lasting protection, hopefully. So the current... So maybe uh, some good things. The current flu vaccines do not induce a good T-cell response? No, very poor, very uh, poor. Okay. So I guess- So these are, these are proteins with a little bit of adjuvant and yeah. they might give a little bit of CD4, and, but hardly any CD8. Okay. Uh, but just enough CD4 to get some B-cell responses, but it's really not nothing compared to the current uh, SARS-2 vaccine. So that's the what, where I was getting at, because if you, for flu, if your antibody levels drop, if your memory drops, then you're screwed because you don't have T cells to back you up. And as you said, the, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines induce a good T cell response. So even if you do get infected, you don't get serious disease as a consequence, right? That's right. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I, think, yeah. I think this is exactly the point that I've been kind of tossing around in my mind for a little bit. Um, so when you talked about the replacement of the different strains and that being due to antigenic differences... Um, you're really looking at B cell epitopes there as the antigen, um, and you're not necessarily thinking about T cell epitope changes. And so maybe if we make a good T cell response, that pattern doesn't hold true. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think for flu, if we would have a strong T and B cell response, we, we wouldn't uh, need to update our vaccines as frequently, I think. So, so there's two things. There's one is, is the diversity of the immune system that gets triggered, so having T cells and B cells, but also the B cell response of being much higher with the current uh, mRNA vaccines than they are with the uh, uh, recombinant proteins or the, uh, the, the split vaccines. Is that true with natural flu infection as well that allows that drift to happen, is that it's mostly a B cell response? No, with natural flu, you also make a good T cell response. So that's why... 
I think it's it's good to have a, a natural infection early in your life, <laughs> so you actually have some cross-reactive T cell response. So there's a big debate about that also in the flu field, and whether you should vaccinate children mm. with uh, with by just inducing a B cell response. Yeah. So that's actually why in the USA, uh, some vaccines are, uh, like to be given to kids is the, is the life attenuated vaccines that actually also give a T cell response. Mm. That's this is why I'm puzzled by what you said. The the idea that we are going to make uh, new SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, you know, to match whatever variant, based only on an antibody assay which has not been standardized. It seems crazy to me, right? Yes, and so far every, everybody is hesitant. I think because so mm. all of the all of the trials that have been done uh, show that the 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 initial vaccines that we have still provide pretty good protection yeah. against all of the variants. And also, there's now studies underway, of course, with some of the variants to start vaccinating with those, and they, those are also cross reactors. So the the question is, of course, how long can we wait mm. until we see? Uh, so many b vaccine breakthroughs that we need to start updating. And this is what happened with flu in the 50s and the 60s with the pandemic vaccine. So people started to use it. And then at some point you see, oh, now we're getting a lot of vaccine breakthroughs and that's a time to update. And of course, in the meantime, all of these companies that produce the vaccines are already doing the studies because they can anticipate this coming. But when it will come, Still not so clear because it depends on two things. Is one, the waning of the immunity in the people that are vaccinated now, and secondly, the level of immune escape that we're going to see of the variants that emerge. Is it a huge jump of that variant? Yeah, then maybe you need to update it quicker. Yeah, I mean, if the question seems to be, if you have a good, if you have a good T cell response that prevents serious disease, right? So it's. Uh, we don't care if people get infected. The key is whether they get moderate to severe disease, right? And as long as the current vaccines do that, uh, I would say they don't have to be changed. But I think we don't know because we, we have no experience, right? Yeah, yeah no, I, that's what I said. If, if I now am protected enough to not end up in the hospital right. and I uh, encounter the virus every now for my friends and family who have been uh, going abroad or to parties, you know, I get boosted and, and I keep my immunity levels up enough to not get to the hospital. It's, it's why I, when I see the press saying, oh, the uh, in, the vaccines don't prevent infection, they don't need to. They just need to prevent you from getting really sick. That's what the flu vaccines do. So when you say uh, we, we, we look at when we have to change the flu vaccines, we look at disease actually, right? Not just infection, right? That's right. That's all we, we care about yeah, is yeah. to prevent hospitalization and death. Great. Okay. Got it. All right. Anybody, anybody have anything else? That's great. I really learned a lot. You're all good? All right. Ron Fouché, Erasmus Medical Center. Thank you so much. I know it's late there, but we appreciate you, know, you coming and chatting with us. It's always a pleasure. Take care. Be safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. This, I, I learned a lot. That's good. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. flu is a good system to learn from because, as he said, they have a hundred years experience, right? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think I'm going to have to listen to this again and sort of draw out some immune responses. Mm -hmm. So the key for flu is the vaccine crappy T cell response. So the B cell response has to be really good, and variants right. evade it. Then you have to change the vaccine, right? That's the bottom line. Right. And right. so for SARS-CoV-2, a good T cell response. Maybe it lasts a long time and the variance doesn't matter because... Plus, plus the B-cell response is giving you these whoppingly good antibodies. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it's kind of a combination of both. But you know what happened? The, the press said, oh, there's an eightfold decrease in neutralization. You know, this, these... It doesn't have, Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't... Yeah. What cares? Was, what matters I, is I, disease, I right? Yeah, maybe this is the level that you need, and this is the level that we're getting. Yeah. And then with the variants, it's it's, maybe it's still here, fine. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, I think, I think I told someone once that um, if I take away ten percent of your money, um, or if we have a ten percent decrease in money, and you go from you know a billion dollars to some hundred million dollars, <laughs> and your goal was just to buy a McDonald's hamburger, it is okay. It's okay. It's a good analogy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. 
Um, I, I think it's all about this. I think when disease starts getting, when the burden of of, of COVID and vaccinated people gets very high, more severe, then you think about changing the vaccine. It's not a booster anyway. That also bothers me. It's not a booster. It's a new vaccine. In the flu field, they, they're new flu vaccines, right? I don't think we call them boosters. Anyway, good stuff. That was nice. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Three o'clock. Okay, maybe we could do a few email here. Um, Kathy, can you take the first one? Sure. Sarah writes, Dear TWIV team, it has been a tough year for anyone who thinks of public health. I suppose if you dismiss public health out of hand, maybe it has been a good year for you. <laughs> I'm an MD with an MPH, so uh, MPH is Master of Public Health. I've tried to explain public health to a lot of people in the last year. Many of them have been family members, neighbors, and friends. Mostly I feel like I've failed. I feel that way because they don't always totally agree with me. Is that a failure? This brings me <laughs> to finally write to you about a subject I'm a bit concerned about. When I was younger, I thought the CDC was the best. They could figure anything out. It may have influenced me to study public health. Currently, the CDC is headed by a very good MD, infectious disease clinician, and leader. But public health principles challenge teachings of patient-focused medicine. And it is in the friction place of the two where I contemplate. As a pediatrician, I initially gave oral polio vaccine. I read articles about breakthrough polio cases in the United States from vaccination. These were rare, but if they were in your child or patient, it wasn't rare. As a public health student, I looked at the worldwide prevalence and incidence, the cost of inactivated polio vaccine versus oral polio vaccine, and tossed up my hands and watched the U.S. change to inactivated polio vaccine. I can argue it both ways. It is the friction between being a bedside pediatrician and a community thinking public health explainer that challenges me. It should challenge all of us. Historically, I have thought of the CDC as the disease centric institution and the WHO as the community institution with respect to breakdown and vulnerabilities. Generally, as Americans, we want the quick fix pill, the cure, the disease model, the CDC. We all know it is harder than that. Smoking, obesity, lifestyle disease are the hardest challenges, just like masking, avoiding indoor contaminated air, and other non-pharmacologic interventions are challenging. I don't have any answers, but more discouraged questions. You all have kept me sane and hopeful through this last year. I wish there was a public health podcast with people like you all. Can you clone yourselves? Sarah. Hmm. So, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, this is what Ga Lori Garrett was lamenting, right? The death of mm -hmm. public health. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you know, she said here in New York City, they fired all the public health people and, and put MDs, which is not the same thing, right? Right. So the CDC head should be a public health person, right? <laughs> right. Maybe one piece of this is perhaps more MDs should have a little bit of public health training. Maybe. Just to understand this discrepancy that Sarah mentions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And could we clone ourselves? We've all been trying to do that for 35, <laughs> 40 years, probably whenever we get overworked and have too many things to do. You know, a public health pod would be really good with the right people. Um, yeah. You know, a monthly where you cover a whole range of public health issues, not just infectious diseases, but everything the CDC does, which is, you know, if remember many years ago, there was something in the olive oil somewhere that was what was that called? It was making people sick. They had to go and investigate it and figure out what was the source. So it's not just viruses and bacteria and fungi and parasites. It's whatever makes people sick like that. That's public health and all the interventions, you know, um, face masking and distancing and taking the handle off the pump. All that's public health, right? <laughs> and people don't appreciated it as much as they did. That's great. Thank yeah, you, Yeah, I think there are a lot of parts to public health that people don't always think yeah. about. Yep. You know, like maternal fetal health or something like that is a big part of public health, but it's not something yeah. people think yeah. of right away. I think I should take Marissa's New York Times piece in the business section today about stick shifts. Favorite quote, being able to drive a manual is a badge of being a true car person. Amen. I've often said that. People get mad at me. 
<laughs> I do think you're, you're at one with your car when you have a stick shift and, you know, you have to clutch. And now I understand it's a hack and it's old and it's being replaced fine. I would like my stick shift. I really feel one with my car, especially when you make a mistake and you grind your gears. Then your car is complaining to you and you go, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Brienne. Yeah, that same sorry. article had, had I can't remember what the percentage now of, of people in the United States that can drive a stick shift, but it's, I think it was on the order of 30% or less. Uh, yeah, it's still so, a lot, yeah. I would so. Yeah. I mean, many old well, trucks, of course, probably have stick shifts, right? I know I'm going to be wrong on that, but I, I can hear them going through all of those 80 gears <laughs> when, <laughs> when a big semi starts up, right? Uh, Brienne, you're next. Sure. John writes, dear Vincent et al., a partly cumulus cloudy and astonishingly comfortable 31 degrees Celsius because of not unreasonable humidity in greater Braddock today. The interview with Lori Garrett was excellent. I've encouraged my non-scientific friends on Facebook to watch it. I wouldn't add to this to my stack of emails except for one thing. Whenever anyone mentions the Asilomar conference, I always think back to general biochemistry at Rutgers when I was a first year grad student. George Pisetnik was newly arrived in 1975. And if I recall correctly, only gave one lecture in the nucleic acid section on DNA sequencing. I'll always remember him asking if we'd seen the picture from the Asilomar conference in Rolling Stone. Mm -hmm. I think Francis Crick, with whom he had published speculating on protein synthesis origins, must have been in the pic. He was quick to note that he was standing just outside the frame of that picture. I really had almost no inter other interactions with him in those following years. But today I wondered if by chance he was still at Rutgers. Indeed, he is, although apparently doing something on the side with Johnson & Johnson. And that led me to this. Since I learned a few episodes back that you don't always have a chance to open link sent, if you search uh, identification unique epitope Pizetnik, um in brackets, you will get what's billed as a review article in medical clinical case reports from just a couple months ago. Um, and he gives us the link. I, it's I only gave the link. Oh, Kathy gives the link. I, I did the search <laughs> that he suggested. Um, it's only one, one and a half pages and six references. So it might qualify for the Guinness record shortest review article, but it advances the hypothesis anyway, that the clotting disorders seen with adenovirus spike vaccines are due to anti-spike antibodies binding platelet factor four because of recognition of an almost identical hexapeptide segment in PF4, um, which is AGFCAS amino acids versus AGICAS amino acids in spike. Anything mentioning peptide segment catches my attention, but I believe that you mentioned in an earlier episode that the cross reaction is from the adenovirus vector. This paper is somewhat is also somewhat oddly written and looking to try to gather whether the journal is legitimate. I note that it's in volume one, number one, which of course is also worrisome, but then I thought it might at least amuse you how an idle reference in 773 led to turning up something that might le then lead back right to SARS-CoV-2 hmm. with continued esteem, John. Uh, so if you had made antibodies to platelet factor four, what would that do? Uh, I think that the idea is that it is supposed to neutralize the platelet factor four and make you have less of it in your body. Mm -hmm. And is that, would that induce clotting then? Is it regulating? I am not an expert on clotting to be able to answer that question. Platelet factor four, let's see. Why yeah, I, I took a quick look at this too. And what I had a hard time thinking is if, if the thing is now just saying... Um, something between the platelet factor four amino acid identity and some COVID-19 protein identity, then why is it a factor in the adenovirus-based vaccines and not in the, not the others? based vaccines? Yeah. I think that that's honestly been a huge question um, yeah. for a lot yeah. of this and leads you to sure. this idea that it has to be a question of the, the adenovirus vector. Right. Reactivity. So platelet factor four, um, 
neutralizes heparin-like molecules on the endothelial surface of blood vessels, inhibiting antithrombin activity and promoting coagulation. So an antibody to PF4 would not promote, maybe it would. Maybe it would, uh, you know, attract. Yeah, that could be. I could see it working either way. All right. But I don't know if that's the case, as Brian said, because it's not happening with all ad vectors, right? Right. And this is one, two, three, four, five, six amino acids. It's like the four amino acid identity or whatever it is in syncytion, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I just don't know. But. That's a cool way you got to that, John. That's neat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Kathy, you're next. Uh, Rich writes, Wired Magazine, July, August issue. And it shows a pie graph, <laughs> sources of lab leak info. And about three quarters of it uh, is attributing it to retweets of non-scientists. Uh, I'd say about an eighth of it is saying journalists with no new information about another eighth is saying cable news squawk shows, and then a tiny little sliver, um, actual epidemiologists. And I think Vincent and I think that that tiny little sliver of lab leak info um, should be accidental. Actual epidemiologists, uh, virologists, uh, and maybe evolutionary virologists yeah. in addition to epidemiologists. Yep. But a large part of it is retweets by non-scientists and Journalists with no new information. Indeed. I like that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rich. Stephen writes, Dear TWIV team, found the paper in your discussion of the anti-dengue strategy centered around Wolbachia bacteria infecting mosquitoes to be fascinating, a welcome diversion from COVID-19. I'm sure Dixon might be aware, but did the rest of you know that AbbVie, in conjunction with the Drugs for Neglected Diseases, Institute have another clever strategy against a different pathogen that involves Wolbachia. The disease is river blindness caused by filarial worms. And rather than attack the worms directly, which is what, by the way, ivermectin would do, they target the Wolbachia bacteria that are symbionts and that the worms depend on for growth, survival, and reproduction. The therapy is called ABBV4083, also known as Tillamac may not be lost on everyone, but the complexity of dealing with not only human PK and ADME, but worm ADME as well is not insignificant. Good news is that in P1 studies, it was well tolerated and now is in phase two trials in Africa. So yes, we have talked about this on TWIP, the fact that you could target the Wolbachia with anti antibiotics and get it that way. I think it's not the only one where Wolbachia is a positive fitness effect for the worm or the parasite. Oh, couldn't because we couldn't resist one COVID-19 question and comment. Have you read Michelle Goldberg's op-ed in the New York Times entitled, Finally Experts Brace this, Break the Silence on the J&J &J Boosters? I received the J&J &J vaccine in March and have been urged by others to get an mRNA booster of some kind, which I've so far resisted. I tend to agree with the comments from a reader R, which I've reproduced below. Would like to know your and Daniel's opinion as well. I don't know. Uh, what, I didn't read this. Did anyone read this uh, op-ed? The next section, uh, no. And then uh, RB, uh, this ABCDE. Do you want to read that? Yeah. So there's a, this is apparently a comment to. So I guess the the op-ed is about giving people who got the J and J vaccine an mRNA booster. So this comment from July 3rd, just to confirm that a you compromised the J and J trial quality and violated the contract of your. Participation in public service through that participation. It's hard to overstate how serious a broach of public trust and data integrity this is. B, you manipulated at best and abused at worst the health system with withholding relevant information that affects eligibility, data collection, and equitable distribution is an abuse of the system. C, you set an example for millions of readers that it's okay to mix and match untested agents. Now, you say you don't mean to encourage this, but your actions speak, speak louder than your words. Maybe this combo will prove sound, but it's also possible this will lead to increased side effects, unknown significant body harms, and even diminished vaccine trust. D, you overindulged with a third helping of resources that should be shared with other parts of the world. What about the healthcare vacuum so many others live in? E, you allege there is an info vacuum kept by, quote, experts, unquote. 
You undermine the point of this vaccine, accessibility. You undermine trust efforts. You fan the flames fallaciously of conspiratorial thinking. Believe it or not, no panel of experts is trying to keep info from you. Wow. Well, I don't know what Daniel thinks, but I'm sure he's listening and he could tell us. I think I should take a look at this op-ed. <laughs> Let's see what it says. Finally, experts break the silence. Um, this lady got her third COVID shot. Michelle Colbert, who's a, who's a regular opinion columnist for the Times, right? Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I realized this was overkill and I'm fairly embarrassed about it. But at that time, I felt like I was operating in an information vacuum. So, yeah, um, she's talking about how she got her third. So we, we actually talked about this last time. Someone had written, several people wrote in and said, should I get a, I got J&J, &J, should I get an mRNA booster? And we said, basically, look, the CDC says they're going to do a trial to see if it's safe. And you should wait because who knows what's going to happen. It's probably okay, but you should wait. And we can't tell you to do it. But if you decide to, you're on your own. <laughs> that was the new thing that, that we're saying. You're on your own, folks, if you try, try to do this. And I mentioned this point about resources, right? Limited vaccines. Maybe you shouldn't get a third shot and give it to someone else. So it's the same idea. So I think you should wait before getting an mRNA booster or shot, yeah, whatever you I want to call it. The statistic for the African continent is something like 1% vaccine coverage. It's something incredibly low. Yeah, it's very low. Yeah. And J&J &J still protect. J&J, &J, if I remember, protected 100% against moderate, severe disease and death in South Africa, where it was mainly the, which variant? Gamma variant? I believe gamma. Yeah, I think you're, I think yeah. you're good with J&J. &J. And so some people say, well, it doesn't protect against infection, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Not, it's disease. You know, they all have some risk of not protecting you against infection. And I have to say in, in, the, in the email from Friday, someone sent a tweet from my former student, Angie Rasmussen, who said she topped up her J&J &J with a mRNA. And I said, what is this, a drinking game? You're topping up? Or is it your car? You're topping up the gas tank. That's not, you should not do that because you went and decided on your own, you would do it. And a lot of people listen to you and now they're going to want to do it. So what happens if all of a sudden we have side effects as a consequence? Then people are, as this comment says, people are going to lose faith in the vaccines, right? I don't know. What do you guys think? Any opinion? You should wait till the CDC's done their work. I, I'd look for some data first. Mm hmm yeah, I, th I think the evidence from the clinical trials for the J&J &J vaccine were that it was efficacious and, if anything, did pretty well against the variant. <clears throat> and there's lots of places that could use vaccines. I don't think you ought to listen to Michelle Goldberg for medical advice anyway, because we wouldn't even give it on TWIV. And <laughs> I think Michelle Goldberg yeah. is less of a science person than we are. All right, one more. This is for Brianne, right? Yeah. From, yes. Jarrett writes, Greeting, Twivians. I am writing to you from a currently rainy Austin, Texas, where Rich and I have been getting alternately soaked and steamed at an extremely soggy 77 degrees Fahrenheit or 298.15 Kelvin, if we want to be very precise about it. Point is, it's gross out there. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if this email should go to TWIV Maine or TWIV Clinical, so I trust Vincent to route it appropriately if it's better addressed by Daniel. My hope is that my concern can be addressed by whoever has the best connections at the CDC. To wit, over the past few months, I have grown increasingly dismayed by a prolific barrage of comments on every one of CDC's Facebook posts relating to COVID-19. An example post of this kind of content here, he gives a link and the, uh, he quotes, Vaccines are the poison, uh, which is one submitted by the pseudonym Linda Forever is your Lord. Uh, another quote, I have decided conclusively that we will not be indulging any organizations by pretending this quote unquote vaccine is legitimate. Sorry, it is not going to happen. And a final quote, no one wants this science experiment. We know people are dying every day from, from the gene therapy. The jig is up. There are two things about this pattern that really bother me. First, there are names that pop up repeatedly on successive posts and people replying to them amplify their comments repeatedly such that they float to the top of the most relevant comment filter Facebook provides. They are never banned, their comments are never deleted. 
What this means is that the CDC is, by lack of moderating action, permitting COVID vaccine deniers to organize on their Facebook posts. To me, this is completely unacceptable. For many reasons over the past five years, we've had ample reason to believe that Facebook can be a powerful tool for amplifying disinformation. Permitting this kind of activity on a high profile federal government social media account means that more people will be exposed to more dangerous nonsense than they would otherwise have been. As far as I can tell from my research, there exists no law or regulation requiring government social media outlets to permit unmoderated commenting. So it's unclear what the motivation is here for the lack of control on the comments. Second, this phenomenon is occurring in the context of the following very sobering report. And he gives a link to a Gallup poll. Polling increasingly demonstrates that resistance to vaccination is solidifying in certain populations. It is hard to imagine this having nothing to do with conspiracy theorist content spreading all over social media. This kind of activity is amplifying an already treacherous public health risk, and I hope someone starts addressing it before it gets even worse. I have tried messaging the page, but unsurprisingly never received a reply. Thanks and happy fourth to everyone. Garrett. Hmm. I think this is a really tough problem because if there was a lot of moderation on the contents here, comments here, I could imagine some of the folks who are against vaccines sort of saying, oh, we're being silenced. Oh, you know, yeah. just like sort of in that previous letter, you know, we're being kept in a vacuum. The experts are silencing us. Yeah. And it's important that we don't have that we response either. Um, and so I think that too much moderation could fuel some fire. Um, but it is really problematic in the way that this is allowing people to uh, amplify each other's voices. So I'm going to show my ignorance about <laughs> Facebook here, but um, couldn't the CDC post things and then just allow zero comments as a standard rule and, yeah. and therefore... Sure. I believe wouldn't, so, yes. Sure, you It can. wouldn't um, be uh, favoring either side, as it were. They would just put their post out there and yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's websites or YouTubes or other things that allow no comments. And yeah, I think that, I, that you're right. Yeah, I could do. Yep. I don't know why you want to have comments on Facebook. Yeah. So CDC, are you listening? Is someone listening in your public affairs media office? Although it says, it says that, the ability to function to disable com comments is not available on Facebook. Sorry, so you can't. Hmm. Although March, hmm. Facebook lets users and pages turn off comments on their posts. Okay, so as of March, you can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, there is a lot of garbage that, and in fact, I should be moderating mine as well, but I don't because it's a lot of work. I try and moderate it on the on Microbe TV. And then people say, why did you delete my comment? It was a good comment. <laughs> it's tough. Oh, it's yeah. a slippery slope. And, the, and there's um, this meme that somebody sent me the other day. Um, and it shows somebody uh, on a stretcher in, outside an ambulance. And the question is, are you taking me to the hospital? No, ma'am. You need top medical experts. We're <laughs> taking you to the comments section. That's good. <laughs> I like yeah. that. Um, this vaccine article is disturbing you know we're stuck at like 75 percent now vaccinated in the u.s people the rest people are not going to get vaccinated and some of the reasons that you heard here you probably heard if you listen to daniel he told the story of a colleague of his who had a patient with covid who died and before she died he said why didn't you get vaccinated she said i heard it had a microchip in it which is the stuff you get on facebook right yeah. And maybe she was innocent and didn't know better, but she's not an anti-vaxxer, but she didn't want a microchip in her, which, you know, you got a cell phone. People could track you with that, you know, <laughs> you don't need a microchip. Yeah. Uh, it's very sad. So 75%, yeah. you know, that's probably around the herd immunity plus natural it's, infections, right? 75% sounds high, Vincent. It's yeah. only 58% here in Washington County. Yeah, I thought it was, good. I thought yeah, it does sound, this, we were talking about they, they missed Biden's goal of 70%. And I thought I'd heard that they got to basically like 66 or 67. Yeah. 
what is it? 76% of the U.S. say they have been vaccinated or plan to be. Ah, that's the difference. Ah. A number that's been stable over the past three months. Yeah, it's unfortunate. There's all kinds of excuses, which you're going to get sick. Daniel said 99% of the people coming to the hospital are not vaccinated. Get vaccinated, folks. An experiment, really? <laughs> well, and, and the comment that says, you know, um, we know people are dying every day from the gene therapy. Oh, right. Really? What people? What gene therapy? Yeah, what gene I, therapy? I, I seem to have missed well, this. There, there's a few. There are a few licensed, right? Right. There's the there's the one for blindness, and the people who re regain their their sight are very grateful for that. And you can you can restore a few other proteins uh, and so forth genes. But, right, but I think they're saying the vaccine is gene therapy, and it's killing lots of people. Well, it's not gene and therapy. That just is not true, in any way. Nope. Not true, but that's typical. None of this is true on the, the naysayers. Not, none of it is true. It's always lies. Oh, well. All right. Let's do some picks. Brianne, what do you have for us? Um, so I have a comic from PhD Comics that is, in fact, uh, I picked it before the, co the conversation started about uh, how things are covered in the news, but it is exactly about that. It's called The Science News Cycle um, from PhD Comics. Uh, which is a great comic site about uh, academia if you haven't seen it before. Um, but this is the science news cycle um, where it starts showing uh, your research um, and your conclusion. And it even has a P value that is uh, not great um, and shows how going from, you know, the university PR office to news organizations, to the internet, to cable news and things uh, that n message can be changed to the point where, you know, your grandmother is wearing some strange hat to protect against it. <laughs> it's uh, great. I think it's, I think it's really funny. And I think it is exactly uh, the point about things getting um, misinterpreted yep. uh, by the news sometimes sort of like a game of telephone um, that we were talking about earlier. I love it. It's great. Local for eyewitness news. Eyewitness. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Well, and, and we have the internet post of scientists out to kill us again and 377 comments of, oh my gosh, I knew it. Yeah. Yep. Kathy, what do you have for us? I have something that I know I've sent to people, but I don't think I ever picked it before. And it's mRNA day lectures from last December. And it has um, Katie Carrico and Drew Weissman giving lectures. Um, hers is historic, uh, how she got to where she was. And his is much shorter and talks about their uh, research developing what became the mRNA vaccines. And then there's a really nice Q&A section. So um, if you haven't seen it and you want to hear from these original people who were working on these uh, RNA vaccines, uh, check these lectures out. Hmm. Yeah, I was just looking, I just searched TWIF and Carico and... The hit was January 3rd, 2021. I picked the, the uh, story on her career, which mm -hmm. was in Wired magazines. Right. Magazine, right. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. You sent this earlier and I watched it and it's just awesome. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my pick is a YouTube channel called Just Planes. Um, you know, I mostly get recommended very similar stuff to my own, but all of a sudden the other day, a, a video came of a of a plane taking off from San Francisco, going to Dublin, and it's a camera in the cockpit with the two pilots talking to each other. It was a guy, the captain, and then his first officer was was a woman, and she was going to be taken off, so she's chatting away. It was and they both have Irish accents. It's so charming. It was great. And uh, this channel is full of these videos of planes taking off and landing big planes, you know. I thought Alan would love this. He probably knows about it. And uh, landing in winds and dangerous conditions and so forth. The only thing that I, I didn't see her hands when she was taking off. I wanted to see her pull back on the stick or whatever it is. <laughs> you couldn't see it. Um, but I've just, they're just like, sitting there calm as anything and there's this huge friggin plane with a lot of people behind them and 
She's just like, yeah, oh yeah, thanks you, good night, have a nice evening. And oh, the other thing is you can hear the um, the ground control or whatever the hell it is, right? The tower conversation. And there's like yeah. 15 different conversations going on. You can't even tell who's who. There's, you know, there's an Italian plane, there's another plane, an American, and uh, they called, this was Air, Irish Air Lingus, Lingus right? Mm-hmm. And they called it for short, hey, Shamrock 102, you're cleared to taxi <laughs> Shamrock 102. <laughs> I, that's fun. I'd yeah. never heard something like that before. It's cool. Yeah, I, I only had time to watch just the very first little bit of this, and it's like, Okay, I can see I'm going to go down a rabbit hole when I have time to watch this. There are lots of them, and they're cool. all, yeah. and, and they actually feature a lot of women pilots, which is cool. Mm-hmm. They have a whole section of women pilots, and they're all, it's just, I mean, I could never do this. I don't know how people learn to do this huge <laughs> plane. Maybe the plane does a lot, right? Um, but I then think that's the idea. They also, when they're getting ready, you know, they're clicking all these switches and going back and forth among each other and this and that. And she said at one point, Airbus has this policy. They don't want a lot of lights on. So once you take off, most of them get turned off except for like six key lights because she said they, I forgot the phrase she used. They want to bring down uh, light fatigue. It was pretty cool. Anyway, that's neat. I'm sure there are a lot of yeah. of uh, channels like this, but I just it just popped up. And I said, whoa, I was listening to some video about how to record or something and edit or whatever, which is usually what I'm doing. And then all of a sudden, oh, I'm going to listen, I'm going to watch this one. (laughs) And it was really good. And it's just perfect for today's episode. Oh, that's right. Today is 777. Yep. I think most of, yeah, these planes are a mix of Airbus and Boeings. You can find just about every one. And um, yeah, they have a couple of cameras, so you get different views. And oh, I remember the one part that was cool. So she's sitting in the right hand, the, the first officer's seat, and she um, pushes the levers up to get the engines going, right? Which I think must be so cool. And she pushes them all up, and then the plane starts moving, and then he, she takes her hand and does something else, and then he grabs them to hold, like hold them forward to make sure they stay there for. <laughs> I don't know why you have to do that, but I thought it was funny. Anyway, there you go. All right, that's uh, TWIV777. What a cool number. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. Send your questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. This morning, Amy and I went to the studio to pick out rug and paint (laughs) (laughs) for the incubator. Did you know we're calling it the incubator? Did I tell you? Oh. Cool. So someone cool. said, you know, Anthony, who emails us a lot, said, you know, Andy Warhol had a studio. He called it the factory. You should give yours a cool name. And so Amy came up with Inky. I think the incubator is cool, right? Because it's could scientific. Be the culture dish. Could be the culture dish. But we needed a one word, you know, factory, yeah. incubator. <laughs> yeah. So the incubator picked out the rugs, gray rug, white walls. <laughs> Boring. Yeah, I know. <laughs> And the guy, the internet guy called me, man, internet is expensive. Holy cow. Yeah, it's it not is. even that's it's not even that fast. Mm. You know, the, the highest he has is uh, 300 down and 75 up. I have more than that at home. Oh, well. What? Yeah, it's horrible, wow. right? Have you, have gigabit, right? You, have, you have gigabit, right? You have gigabit. Yeah, yeah. I have wow. gigabit at home, but this must not be fiber, you know? It's too bad. <laughs> Uh, anyway, yes, so the, the, we hope to move in, or I hope to move in um, maybe August and start recording there. That would be cool. Anyway, so you can contribute to help pay the bills. Microbe.gv slash contribute. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. It's good to have Ron Fouché on. You were there for the Fort Collins one, right? Mm-hmm. I was. Yeah. Yeah. It was fun. Brianne Barker's at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on the Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm Vincent Yellow. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Yellow. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.